Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello we are going to deal with Victorian poetry this week. We begin with a general introduction to Victorian poetry from this period 1837 to 1901. First, we will pay attention to the historical and literary context, identify the features of Victorian poetry, discuss certain poetic forms practiced during this period, list a few poets who were prominent in this period and pay special attention to the dramatic monologue form which became very popular during this time. We will continue with pre-Raphaelite brotherhood movement during this Victorian period, also discuss art for art sake movement for a while, then discuss two more interesting features of Victorian poetry, one is religious poetry and another is nonsense poetry. The historical context is closely linked to with the period of Queen Victoria from 1837 to 1901. Many critics may not agree with this periodization, but generally it serves our purpose. Values of honor, duty, moral seriousness and sexual propriety were highly valued at this time, but it was well known that Many of those Victorians maintained double standards, one in private life and another in public life. There was a relative political, social and economic stability during this long reign of Queen Victoria. During this time, industrial revolution became much more serious and ushered in the era of this workshop of the world for England. England came to be known as the workshop of the world because of many industries and factories. This period also witnessed advances in science and technology, steam engine, transport, communication, printing and medicine among others. There were many social and political reformations for which several bills and acts were passed during this period. Certain notable historical events we may mention here, one is this 1857 incident or even the first war of Indian independence, it shook this British empire. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his famous book on the origin of species and shook this western belief in evolution of human beings from gods and things like that. And then we have this 1870 education act which brought in compulsory elementary education for all people in England and brought about radical social change in the social setup of England. Because of these various changes that took place in this uh, time, there was a conflict between faith and doubt. People could not believe in God or society as they used to have earlier. One more serious uh, factor that we have to consider is the rise of women power during this time. The literary context is also equally very important for us to understand this period. Wordsworth was the poet laureate until 1850 that is his death. Immediately after this Tennyson followed Wordsworth as poet laureate in 1850. We have to understand that Elizabeth Barrett Browning before her marriage was a very popular poet and she gave a tough fight to Tennyson when it came to the choice of this poet laureateship. Poetry, prose, novel and criticism all were developing during this period in different ways. However, the novel became the most dominant literary form of this age. Writers could not have faith in religion and society completely because the old beliefs were floundering in front of their own eyes. The most important poetic form that became very popular in this period is the dramatic monologue. 
which took shape seriously in the hands of Tennyson, Browning and other poets. More women writers arrived on the scene especially in the novel form and contributed to the development of Victorian literature in general particularly poetry. What are those features of uh, Victorian poetry that we need to keep in mind while we deal with this Victorian poetry? Here we have listed some of them. Conflict between religion and science is the major one, faith and doubt. Interest in medieval themes, those writers went back to the past and looked for sources of inspiration. We also notice radical changes in social life which contributed to the flourishing of literature in this period. The poets and writers of this period paid attention to sensory expressions and images. They were also sentimental in their writings. Further, they took interest in this verbal embellishment which we can see more in poets like Tennyson. We also notice mystical interrogation. What is this life? What is this serious aspect of this life? Is there anything which we can understand so easily? That is a kind of mystical experience or interrogation poets of this time, writers of this time had. Similarly, they were all brooding and they were all skeptically thinking about life and society in general. We have a very curious case of nonsense poetry at this time. That is why we have mentioned this whimsical nonsense. We will have some examples for this nonsense poetry as well. Let us see the Victorian poetic forms. There were many, we will see three of them here. One is the dramatic monologue, the second is the epic and the third is the sonnet sequence. We must remember that we looked at this sonnet sequence when we discussed Elizabethan poetry. Now let us begin with the dramatic monologue. It is a lyric poem in the voice of a speaker other than the poet addressing a listener occasionally. We have the examples in Tennyson, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Robert Browning and we have one more well known feminist writer of this time Augusta Webster. There are many others as well. Epic poetry was also quite popular at this time. It is a long narrative poem telling stories though not realistically like the novel. We have examples in Tennyson's Idols of the King, George Eliot's The Spanish Gypsy, William Morris's the earthly paradise. When it comes to the sonnet sequence, we understand this as a lyric poem on various themes, not just on love alone. It dealt with love and death and many other themes. We have some examples in George Eliot's, the novelist of course, the famous novelist George Eliot also wrote a sonnet sequence in this time, brother and sister sonnets. Next we have Christina Rossetti, a woman poet. Mona in nominata. Then again Augusta Webster, a, a female poet. She has mother and daughter sonnets. Then of course, one more woman writer Elizabeth Barrett Browning, she also has a sonnet sequence, sonnets from the Portuguese. It is a curious case of finding more sonnet sequence from women writers at this time. Here we have a list of Victorian poets, of course there are quite a lot of them, but here are some prominent ones beginning from Lord Tennyson, Robert Browning, Matthew Arnold, Gerard Manley Hopkins, A.C. Swinburne, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, William Morris, Oscar Wilde, Edward Lear, Thomas Hardy. When we come to Thomas Hardy, we move on to the next century that is 20th century. He links Victorian poetry with 20th century poetry. Then we have a list of women poets, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Christina Rossetti, George Eliot whose pen name is Mary Ann Evans, Augusta Webster and then you have very interesting case of two writers using one name that is a pseudonym actually, Michael Field. Catherine Harris Bradley is a female writer and another is Edith Emma Cooper, they were writing poems, stories, novels collaboratively under this name Michael Field. When we look at Victorian poetry, two prominent poets come to our mind, Lord Tennyson and Robert Browning. They have their own specific features, 
we will pay attention to them when we discuss their own poetry separately. Here we have just a comparison to understand the significance of these two poets for Victorian poetry. Tennyson was educated at the University of Cambridge whereas Robert Browning was self educated at home. Tennyson more often lived in England whereas Robert Browning left England and chose to live in Italy. While Tennyson is influenced by Wordsworth, we find the influence of Shelley on Browning. Similarly, we find uh, Tennyson is more uh, commercially successful whereas Robert Browning is more socially popular. In the case of Tennyson, we have more doubt, skepticism and in Robert Browning, we find faith and the general tenor of Tennyson's poetry is lyrical whereas the tenor of Robert Browning is dramatic. While Tennyson is mostly melancholic, Robert Browning is majorly sanguine that is optimistic. These features will help us to understand the major conflict in uh, Victorian poetry, faith and doubt. We said the dramatic monologue is the most important poetic form that we have to understand when it comes to Victorian poetry. A critic called Sessions wrote an article on the dramatic monologue in 1947. She has identified seven features of a perfect example of dramatic monologue. Then in decreasing order certain qualities may be missing in some forms. So, we let us pay attention to these seven features which we need to identify in a dramatic monologue. Speaker, audience, occasion, interplay or interaction between the speaker and the audience, uh, revelation of character, dramatic action and lastly action taking place in the present. These are the features which we will find in a perfect example of a dramatic monologue. The example that we have chosen is Browning's My Last Duchess which has all these seven features. The speaker is a duke, the audience is the envoy that is a messenger, the occasion is a wedding plan discussion of the duke with the envoy, the interaction between the speaker and the audience we find between the duke and the envoy, they interact throughout the poem. We have the character revelation of the duke as well as the duchess. Then we have this dramatic action of the death of the duchess which led to finding a new duchess for the duke. Then the whole action takes place in the present. The action is unfolded in front of the eyes of the reader as it happens as we read the poem. We have just two extracts from my last duchess. It's a long poem, but we will have just two extracts. First extract is this, that is my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now, Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands. Will it please you sit and look at her? I said, Fra Pandolf by design for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turn, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst. The second extract is here, quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in you disgust me, here you miss or there exceed the mark, and if she let herself be less and so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping and I choose never to stoop. Oh sir, she smiled no doubt whenever I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands. Actually the duke had killed his duchess and got her painted and he has this painting of this duchess and this painting is shown to the envoy who have come to negotiate the wedding for the new duchess and the duke. This is a very important phenomenon of Victorian time. This is called the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood. It is an art movement inspired by the pre-Raphael and pre-Renaissance period especially Italian medieval painters in the continent. 
This movement valued simplicity, sincerity and directness of truth. It was founded in England by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, John Everett Millais and William Holman Hunt. Many painters wrote poems and started a literary style which included Christina Rossetti and William Morris. They used picturesqueness, idealism and mysticism in their poems. They also infused life into medieval art and literature and took special shape of their own as pre-Raphaelite movement, brotherhood or poets. We have an example from Christina Rossetti's poem in an artist studio published in 1856. This is a sonnet. Rossetti herself was a model for her own brother for painting. Here we have a description of what happens in a studio. One face looks out from all his canvases, one self same figure sits or walks or leans. We found her hidden just behind those screens that mirror gave back all her loveliness a queen in opal or in ruby dress, a nameless girl in freshest summer greens, a saint, an angel, every canvas means the same one meaning, neither more nor less. He feeds upon her face by day and night and she with the true kind eyes looks back on him, fair as the moon and joyful as the light, not when with waiting, not with sorrow dim, not as she is but was when hope shown bright, not as she is, but as she fills his dream. Next, we pay attention to this movement called Art for Art Sake movement. This is an offshoot of the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood actually. They believed in art as religion for its own sake. They had the principle of autonomous and self-sufficient art having intrinsic values. They pitched against the utilitarian values of the Victorian period. This was originally a French aesthetic practice and introduced into England by Walter Pater. English practitioners include Pater, Oscar Wilde, Arthur Simons and A. C. Swinburne. This movement is a forerunner of symbolism and modernism with its emphasis on visual images and fidelity to truth. It finally led to decadence with an obsessive focus on physical and mental aberrations that is abnormalities including experiments with drugs and extra natural sexual experiences. We have an example from one of the practitioners of this art for art sake movement, Swinburne. His poem is called A Forsaken Garden and we have that last stanza alone here. Till the slow sea rise and the sheer cliff crumble, till terrace and meadow the deep gulfs drink till the strength of the waves of the high tides humble, the fields that lessen, the rocks that shrink, here now in his triumph where all things falter, stretched out on the spoils that his own hand spread, as a god self slain on his own strange altar, death lies dead. Religious poetry was also there at this time, it was uh, even quite popular as we can see from the practice of John Henry Newman. Religious fervor was equally powerful in Victorian era. The evangelists, the Christian evangelists went to the whole of the world and spread Christianity. There was a need for divine grace to move from darkness to light as exemplified well in John Henry Newman's poem, Lead Kindly Light. First, let us see this stanza 1. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home, lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distant scene, one step enough for me. The next two stanzas are here. I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou shouldest lead me on. I love to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. I loved the garish days and spite of fears, pride ruled my will, remember not past years. So long thy power hath blessed me, sure it still will lead me on, over moor and fen, over crag and torrent, till the night is gone. And with the morn those angel faces smile, 
which I have loved long since and lost a while. It exemplifies faith, complete faith in God as we saw the religious conflict or the conflict between religion and science. Here we have an example of the extreme faith in God. Now we come to nonsense poetry. It was also interesting to see at this time that Lewis Carroll's novel Through the Looking Glass contained some nonsense poems. Edward Lear became a serious practitioner of this form. He has a collection of poems called Nonsense Songs, Stories, Botany and Alphabets published in 1871. We can ask a few questions like this, is poetry sensible? The answer may be yes, no. Is there a distinct nonsense poetry? Of course, yes. Is it a Victorian invention? Certainly not. We have a very early example. One of the earliest examples for this nonsense poem is this. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, the little dog laughed to see such sport and the dish ran away with the spoon. It is a nursery rhyme. Many rhymes may not make sense to children, but they love them. We have the example of nonsense poetry from Edward Lear's poem called The Owl and the Pussycat. We have only the first stanza here. Stanza 1. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh lovely pussy, oh pussy my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. To summarize whatever we have looked at so far in this topic Victorian poetry, we have paid attention to historical and literary context, we listed the various features of Victorian poetry, paid attention to the conflict between religion and science that is faith and doubt among many others. We saw the three major Victorian forms, dramatic monologue, epic and sonnet sequence. We listed many poets of this period including Tennyson and Browning. We examined this dramatic monologue and identified the features, gave an example from Browning himself that is my last duchess. We discussed pre-Raphaelite brotherhood, art for art sake movement and also religious poetry, nonsense poetry. For each of these we gave examples so that we can have a better understanding of various aspects of Victorian poetry. Some references here, those of you who are interested in pursuing further can read at least one or two of these references. Thank you.